So we move into this chapter 10. It's on boiling and condensation. These are very important um, mechanisms for the transfer of heat. How many people have benefited from air conditioning systems? Yeah, everybody. And they have an evaporator. Guess what's happening inside the evaporator? It's changing phase, uh, like boiling. Uh, and then what? And do you have a condenser? Sure, you have a condenser. So there's a lot of systems. Um, any refrigeration system has this phase change from liquid to vapor, vapor back to liquid. Okay, so it's a long chapter. Um, you're happy to see that we're going to skip quite a bit of it near the end, but I want to give you a, uh, some appreciation for it. Uh, it starts off with uh, dimensionless parameters used in boiling and condensation analysis. What do you mean by dimensionless parameters? Are you accustomed to any dimensionless parameters? Can you tell me one dimensionless parameter? The Reynolds number, the Nusselt number, Prano number. You know, there's quite a few of them, aren't there? Uh, but what you have is you're going to have some new dimensionless parameters, especially for boiling and condensation. You'll still have our Nusselt number because we're really still in the hunt. What are we hunting for? In this, you know, convection analysis, we're in the hunt for H. <laughs> Can I get H? All right. Uh, boiling modes. We'll talk about how you, as you have a hotter surface in contact with the fluid that's saturated, ready to change phase, uh, as that temperature of the surface gets greater and further above the saturation temperature of the fluid that it's in contact with, then you get um, a more aggressive boiling. And we'll talk about the different modes of boiling. We'll talk about pool boiling before we talk about forced convection boiling. What do you think the difference between pool boiling and forced convection boiling is? You just have a pot and it's sitting there and there's no pump forcing it through. Forced convection boiling, maybe you think about a pipe and then you have flow through the pipe and now the walls of the pipe are very hot. So as it's flowing through the pipe, it's actually changing phase and it comes out the other end uh, um, um, vapor. And so that would be a forced convection boiling. Um, you can likewise have the convection where you have it in a stagnant or stationary material or you can have condensation inside of tubes where you have bolt flow inside those tubes. All right, well, we're going to be tired just covering the first half. And then the second half is condensation. Same thing, we talk about the physical mechanisms like we do with boiling. Uh, then there's laminar and turbulent, there's dropwise film condensation. Um, in radial systems, horizontal, inside of horizontal tubes, so the outside of systems, inside of systems. And guess what? Most of this we just don't have time for, and it's a little on the tedious side. So we're going to skip a lot of the condensation. The focus really is on boiling. All right, Buckingham Pie. Have you ever heard of the Buckingham Pie Theorem? Can you summarize it? What what is it? What's the main idea in the Buckingham pie? Dimensional analysis. It's one way to look for and find out how many dimensionless groups you should have for this system for this problem. And uh, the the how does the procedure go? You make a list of all of the what? All of the physical variables that come into play. All of those. So. Once you make a list of all those variables, you take a look at the fundamental units of each of those variables and you tally up and you count how many are the fundamental units. What would be a, an example of a fundamental unit? Length in uh, meters uh, or mass in kilogram or time in seconds, things like that. Now, I'm not a stickler on it. I, I'm more of the concept. And I remember I taught a class and I taught them to, because you have to, you're always having to translate. And it's like, okay, we're looking for that 
fundamental unit of length, but it's easier if I talk about it in meters. <laughs> anyway, um, so I'm a little different than most textbooks in that regard. Um, but you get your the number of the fundamental uh, dimensions or units, like length, time, mass. Okay, and then the difference. You have this number minus that number. What does that tell you? Yeah, so if you had, uh, I don't know, five variables and three fundamental units, you would have how many? Two pi groups. And there you go. That's the Buckingham Pi theorem. Now, you can make it more elaborate and all that, but when you approach something new like boiling and condensation, and yes, we do get a lot of variables in it, uh, you'll have a lot of groups, and equations and correlations are a little more complicated. So in, in the... We're looking for that H. It depends on the difference in the saturation and the surface temperature. So instead of having two T's, just have one T, TS minus T sat. Surface minus the saturation temperature of the fluid that's in contact with the surface. You have body force arising from the liquid vapor density difference, uh, which is, this is in the way, isn't it? which is G times the difference in the row. So um, if I have a pot of water and uh, the density of the water, the liquid, is about the same as the density of the vapor, then if I form a bubble, it's filled with vapor, there's really not much um, buoyancy-driven uh, mechanism to make it want to float to the top. But if the density of the liquid is high compared to the density of the vapor in the bubble, guess what the bubble wants to do? Shoot to the top. <laughs> really go to the top quickly. Okay. And then you have the latent heat. Then you have the surface tension. Then you have some length scale. And then you have a lot of properties like the density of the liquid, density of the vapor, specific heat liquid, specific heat vapor, conductivity of liquid, conductivity of vapor, and then viscosity of liquid, viscosity of vapor. You do a little counting and you find, well, there's about 10 variables of interest. And you break them down and you look and there's a length, there's a mass, there's a time. What is joule? Joule is an energy uh, and the temperature, um, but, but you could break it. Sometimes you're stuck with um, not being able to go all the way down to the fundamental units. But uh, have five dimensions, hence you're looking for five pi groups. So if you're looking for a new salt number, hey, isn't this chapter still a hunt for H? <laughs> We're doing a look for a new salt correlation. It'll be some sort of function or correlation of and then they group in the parameters. So it could be as complicated as four groups of parameters. If I take a look at some of these parameters, this one's probably the easiest to see because if I put a row mu over row, I, put, I just multiplied by row on numerator, denominator, and then I have the specific heat in K, what is mu over rho? Isn't that new? Yeah. And then what's k over rho c? Alpha. Guess what that parameter is? Prandtl. Prandtl number, nu over alpha. So this, this some of these look familiar. Prandtl number. Okay. Um, this g times the difference in density really gives us that push, that buoyancy to, to make a bubble, a vapor bubble, move up in a liquid, saturated liquid. Um, I have a row here. I divide by mu. I have some length scale. What does this just kind of look like? It looks almost like a, like a, 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 a Reynolds number. Yeah, it has that characteristic. It's probably the ratio of something to make it want to move to something that makes it want to, with the viscosity, not want to move. So buoyancy to viscous. And likewise, over here is some buoyancy to surface tension. Um, 
surface tension holding it together. Okay, and then this is oh, how much um, sensible to latent heat. So sometimes you have good insight. I think uh, the Jacob number, Prandtl number, Bond number, and a modified Reynolds number, but this is just an allude, allude to all the complexities of boiling and then condensation. So let's start off with the simplest, it's pool boiling. You have essentially uh, stagnant liquid sitting on top of a hot solid surface and on top you have a vapor. And so if you have the temperature of the solid higher than the saturation temperature of the liquid, well, it would like to form some vapor pockets. And as it forms some vapor pockets, the bubbles will um, form particular sites. If you ever looked at a pot of water on a stove, you'll see that, oh, it, it like it, there's a favorite little point where the vapor bubbles grow. And they get bigger, and then they pop off, and then another little vapor bubble starts right there again. And those are what they call nucleation the beginning sites for little vapors pockets. So, um, And then once they're detached, they go to the surface and then join the rest of the vapor that's out there. If you take a look at the temperature profile, so this is the temperature scale as a function of distance, we see that we have this temperature of the surface is higher than the saturation temperature. That's our excess, delta Te or excess temperature. So if you're maybe putting electric resistive heat to the solid, you crank it up and crank it up and crank it up, you can move the surface temperature higher and higher and higher, and you'll have a more rapid form, rate of formation of uh, vapor bubbles and then uh, more rapid heat removal from that surface. All right, well, way back when, 1934, Nukiyama uh, did an experiment, and uh, I'm sure he did it in Japan, uh, analyst or a scientist in Japan. And he was one of the first to really do a decent job of putting the whole uh, range of regimes in, in uh, understanding this boiling. Okay, so what's the experiment? He had a, a tank of uh, water, and he did it with, I think, or at least other people have done it with other substances since then and the water would be at the saturation state. And so if it's at 1 atm, what is the temperature of this water? 100 degrees C. So the water is at 100 degrees C, and it's in equilibrium with the vapor that's above it. There's no air in the system, just have water vapor. So water vapor above the liquid water. And he had a wire, and uh, the wire was attached and it could pass a current through that wire. And it's a thin wire and there's some electric resistive heating that happens to that wire. And so the surface temperature of the wire becomes great, a lot higher than, or a few degrees higher than the saturation temperature of 100 degrees C of the water. That would be our excess temperature. And what it noticed was you could form little pockets of bubbles. And what he did was he had a variac, and he could control the voltage uh, that is applied to, across that wire. And as he uh, increased the voltage, you increase the current, you increase the power, and you get more vapor bubbles forming. And he went through the whole regime where he would crank it up, crank it up, and crank it up. So the data showed something like this. This is a complicated plot. What do they plot on the x-axis? Can you see that? Delta T with a subscript E. What's the name of that? Excess temperature. And it's the surface temperature minus the saturation temperature. Now, is it on a log scale or a linear scale? It's a log scale. It covers a lot of ground. So down here, we just have one degree. Hey, where is zero? Well, if on a log scale, where is zero? 
<laughs> it's way, way, because it's 0.1 then 0.01 and 0.001, so forget it, just start it at 1 degree C. <laughs> and then it's 5 and then 10 degrees. Now 30, then 100 degrees C, then 1,000 degrees C. That's a big difference between the surface temperature of that wire and the saturation temperature of the fluid, 1,000 degrees C. Okay, now what about the y-axis? What's the plot? Yeah, what's the heat flux coming off of that surface of that electrically resistive heated wire? Look at the units, watts per meter squared. Now, uh, it's hard to tell, but can you see if it's, what would you think, linear or log? Log. I mean, it, there's a l large variation in very high. So uh, as he starts to heat it, let's say there's only one degree C, there is some convection coming off of it. I don't know why this is zero. It shouldn't be zero there. It should be something. Uh, but that's not the main point. But as you heat it up a little bit, excess temperature gets up here. And we're, we're just having a convection, no vapor pockets forming. It's like m moving the heat away uh, from that so surface into the fluid by uh, buoyancy-driven flow. But then around here, you get some departure. You start to get uh, the onset, I'm sorry, the onset of nucleate boiling. And so at particular points, maybe only a few, some vapor bubbles will form. And as the vapor bubble forms, it, it detaches, floats up, and other liquid in the vicinity rush to replace it. And then you get a little mechanism to form another vapor bubble. And then you keep cranking it up, and you get very in strong increase in the rate of heat transfer. Uh, here they show the minimum. And then up here, what do they show a maximum? So Nukiyama loved it. I'm sure I would have loved to do this experiment too. Play with that very act, turn up the voltage, turn up the voltage until something exciting happens. And uh, up in this vicinity, you're generating a lot of bubbles. Things are being pretty aggressive. But then guess what happens? You need to keep that surface wet. The liquid needs to rush back to replace the bubble to fill the little crevice to then allow it to vaporize and then grow and then detach and then float off. But you're getting so many bubbles that the liquid's having a hard time getting back there. And you get up to a maximum heat flux. And at that point, you crank it up a little more you make that surface get a little hotter, and then you can't get the liquid to go back. And what happens is you get a layer of vapor that surrounds that surface. And what will happen is, is there will be a jump in the temperature of the wire. It will be a very high temperature of the wire, like pretty fast when you hit that point. And he was playing with some particular type of wire, nichrome wire. And the nichrome wire did a little excitement, popped, it burned out, right? It melted too hot. So he frustrated a little bit, scratched his head. He said, I'll change the material. And so he went and he went and got some platinum wire that can handle the temperature. And then he was able to play out in this region which is a very high temperature wire. And you're able to then even get a higher rate of heat transfer, but it's excessive because you have a film of vapor there. You're not getting the liquid to rush back. Has anybody had an experience where you have a very hot, flat surface and you flick a little water onto it? And normally, if I had a drop of water and I flicked it onto this surface, it would wet it. But have you ever put a water droplets and what happened? What do you see? It, it's like dancing. Guess what? It's a vapor pack uh, layer right there. The same type of behavior. And what they were able to do is they were able to back it down and they could explore all this region such that they had very high excessive 
Oh, that's what this min is. I got confused, sorry. The departure nucleate boiling is down in this vicinity. Uh, this is a minimum at which you could have pool, um, not pool, um, a, a layer of vapor, uh, film boiling they call it, and then if you get it down in this vicinity, it'll jump back. And then you'll be back to um, nucleate boiling. So this is some hysteresis. Um, it's like if you're going this way, boom. Or if you're going that way, boom. And then later, people were able to get very good controls, and they're able to explore in this region. But it's, it's, that's pretty difficult. Okay. That's Nukiyama's experiment. Uh, so what he d observed, here's a better scale. Look at the, the y-axis. Can you see now it's definitely log? And you can see that it's not zero here, is it? It's small, but it's not zero. It's like 10 to the whatever, 10 to this, 10 to that. Okay, and so up in here you have uh, a convection, buoyancy-driven, natural convection, or free convection, you call it, until you get to the O-N-B. What do you think that acronym, O-N-B? Well, the B is for boiling. The beginning or the onset and so the onset of some sort of boiling what's that N stand for onset of nucleate boiling nucleate boiling it's just a terminology in the literature so I want to expose it to you and then you pick up you're stronger and stronger in the nucleate boiling there's a lot of boiling applications which are in the nucleate boiling region I mean you don't have to do much in a kitchen before you're doing a lot of nucleate boiling Put a pot of water, and like right now, I like to eat some sweet corn because it's in season, right? And you have to boil it. There you go. Onset of nucleate boiling. Okay, but very rarely in the kitchen do we get up in this vicinity. If we do, we probably have a problem. <laughs> so we get to the critical heat flux. That's the maximum at which you can, you're going to go away from nucleate boiling, you're going to go to a different type of boiling. Instead of nucleate boiling, you're going to jump way over to film boiling. Now you can get film boiling in this region too, so there's a wide range of film boiling. Okay, uh, I forgot to emphasize, in the nucleate boiling you have isolated bubbles, and then you get like jets and columns and it's filling more and more places and more uh, locations are uh, generating vapor and then you get it all film covered with the vapor and then you get the film boiling. This is that transition region. So they have some illustrations. Here's methanol, horizontal tube, the nucleate boiling in jets and columns and, and A and then they have a film boiling where they have a layer of vapor. You still have boiling, but it um, has a very high surface temperature. So these nucleate, some first time you see that word, you think, what is this? Nucleate boiling, they have a good definition in Wikipedia's type of boiling that takes place where the surface temperature is hotter than the saturated fluid temperature by a certain amount, that's excess temperature. But where the heat flux is below the critical heat flux, the critical heat flux is the peak of the curve between the nucleate boiling and the transition boiling regime, just like we saw in Nukiyama's plot. So you have these little crevices, and they're filled with liquid, but as soon as it's hot, then it turns to vapor, it expands, pushes out, it gets, grows, comes outside, and then it'll be too much, it'll detach, and then liquid rushes back in to replace it. And so these are what they call the beginnings of bubble formation, nucleation, like nuclear, the beginning. Well, Rosenau developed a correlation. It wasn't the first, but in 1952 he published this correlation uh, to describe or correlate a lot of data for nucleate pool boiling. All right, here it is. It's a long equation. Well, you would expect it because of all the dimensionless groups and the complexity of the physics. So first of all, let's just take a look. They're going to give you Q double prime 
at the surface, so the heat flux. What is this? Parameter, mu sub, what is that subscript? L4, liquid mu4, thermal conductivity, no, Prandtl number, no. What is mu4? Viscosity of the liquid, HFG. Heat of vaporization, yeah. Okay, G, that's an easy one. If you've been shy all week or all month or all semester, here it is, G. Yeah, it's uh, Earth's gravitational acceleration or the relationship, constant proportionality between weight and mass. So if somebody says G is equal to 9.81 meters per second squared, are they correct or incorrect? Correct. Okay. If G is equal to 9.81 newtons per kilogram, are they correct or incorrect? And actually, this is the way we use it. This is the way you drop things and watch them fall. This is the way you put something heavy on a table and need to be able to support it. <laughs> so, and this is actually the way we talk primarily primarily about G. Anyway, then row L and then row V, what are these? Density of the liquid and density of the vapor. And then sigma, that's a tough one, sigma. We haven't seen it this semester. We saw it in fluid mechanics. Yeah, it's not the Stefan Boltzmann. We're recycling out of fluid mechanics. Sigma in fluid mechanics was surface surface tension surface tension yeah yeah i know it's like turn one page and sigma something else in this book all right cp sub l cp specific heat constant pressures comma l meaning for the liquid delta te excess temperature that's the surface minus the saturation temperature okay this c Subscript S comma F. All right. This value is in this table 10.1. It's a coefficient. And it's uh, the C, S, lost that, and then bringing it over. But this is the value. So if, it, if it's water with a copper surface that's polished, there's your value. If you have water and stainless steel and you have polished or chemically etched that people have studied and did lots of measurements and so there's a coefficient fit there's another coefficient n so this c sub subscript s comma f and this n is right there well for a lot of dimes it is one isn't it but i think i tried to i don't know if i have more in here but you want to scroll down. I don't know if I can scroll down. So this table is a lot longer. I just show the beginning at the top part of the table. All right. That's just the Prandtl number for the liquid raised to the exponent n. And if it n is 1, then you didn't really do much, did you? And then what's this HFG? Heat of vaporization. This is cubed. This is 1 half power. So this is Rosenau's correlation. Where is it valid? In the nucleate boiling zone or region. All right. There's another equation that gives us the critical heat flux for nucleate pool boiling. So they put the max on there. So Q double prime max is equal to this coefficient C. Now, this is where you have to really dive into the book and read not only the equation, but the paragraph before and after the equation to understand, because a lot of times they'll embed and say, whoa, this coefficient C is equal to 0.131 for horizontal cylinders, or it's 0.149 for large horizontal plates. And then this is familiar, this is familiar, etc. Hey, what was that sigma again? Surface tension, that's right. Uh, well, you have to look it up often for whatever substance it is at whatever temperature. Yeah. So the equation we looked at before this, that was for the heat flux at the surface? And this is for the, also the heat flux, but it's at that critical, at the maximum, right where you're going to depart from nucleate boiling and go to.
to uh, film boiling. Yeah. So let's solve a problem. We have a polished bottom of a copper pan. So right away you have copper, you have a polished copper surface. And you have 150 millimeters in diameter. It's maintained at 116 degrees, 116.5 degrees C by a heating element on an electric range. Now, estimate the power required to boil water in this. So here's our fluid water. There's our copper polished surface. And you're going to boil water. Okay. Um, what do you think the pressure of the water is I'm putting on an electric stove or electric range. You have to interpret things like this. You have to, well, I think it's one ATM. You could have it at an elevated pressure if it was in a pressure cooker. But given that they say electric range, it's one ATM, one atmosphere. All right. So what is the temperature, the saturation temperature of the water in the pot that's boiling 100 degrees C. Now you're going to probably want to convert things to Kelvin so that would be 373 Kelvin and then for the um, temperature of the surface it's 389.65 Kelvin. All right. How are we going to solve for the first part? What is the power required to boil the water in the pan. Well, it's just like a lot of engineering. They spend a little time showing you some equations and then they say apply the equation. <laughs> and so we're probably going to be in a nucleate boiling regime. Uh, we're probably not at the maximum because if I look down here they say, determine the evaporation rate. Okay, what is the ratio of the surface heat flux to the critical heat flux? Meaning that if you're at that or above, you're not at nucleate boiling. And, and the answer is about 50% of the way. So we're in the nucleate boiling range. But you don't even need to solve these. You would just assume them um, that you're in the nucleate boiling regime. So we solved this problem by looking for the Q double prime from Rosenau's correlation. So that Rosenau correlation, what that was equation in our textbook, 10.5. And so Q double prime is equal to this mu of the liquid, HFG. Then we have in parentheses G rho of the liquid minus rho of the vapor divided by the surface tension all raised to the one half power then we're going to have cp of the liquid the excess temperature the coefficient csf the hfg heat of vaporization and then the prandtl number raised of the liquid raised to the exponent power n and all of that cubed. Yes, sir. That's going to be in another correlation, capital C with no subscripts. And yeah, yes. Um, right. Let's go back. Yeah, yeah. This caps without any subscripts. You're right. Yep. All right, so let's do this one. Uh, I'll, I'll do this one. 9.81. Great. Done. Okay, you do the rest. No. What's the next easiest? What is this? 16.5. Hey, I need it in Kelvin, not degree C. 16.5 Kelvin, same, right? It's a temperature difference. 9.81. Um, hmm. Okay, let's get these coefficients out of the table. So we go back and we look at the table. It's copper polished with water. So here it is. It's uh, water, copper, polished. There's my value of C and N. 0.0128 and 1. 
So this one's 0 0.0128, and that's 1. All right. All right. Um, should I do some of these as clicker? And uh, let's see if you can find them, evaluate them. Um, how about this one? If you take a look at the Rosenau correlation, I don't know if I have it here. Do I have it up there? No. Let me take a look. No. I didn't grab it. But there's a line that says all properties are for the liquid except rho v. So, um, this surface tension sigma, are you going to look up the surface tension of water vapor? It doesn't make sense. It's, it's liquid water surface tension. Okay. And then, then the sentence is a little confusing. If I was an editor, I'd have stopped. I'd have put a dot there. Then I would have thought, begun a new thought process, a new statement, a new sentence. And say, this is on page 603, say something like, all properties should be evaluated at TSAT. Now we're going to get to another correlation today, and it's going to be all properties evaluated at T-film. So you have to pay attention. What do they want this at, TSAT or T-film? So I need to get this one at the saturation temperature of 100 degrees C for water. Um, should I do this as a numeric clicker? or not. And what would the units be on the surface tension sigma? Yeah, Newton per meter, right? So that surface tension is, how are you going to find that surface tension? How about somebody find it and then read it off to me? Tell me what page they're on. 1003. So 1003. My book has different page numbering than that. What version of your book you're in? A point A six. Very good. Table A six. So on table A6, you look up, they put in, it's in Kelvin for the temperature index, but they put the boiling point. And uh, there's a column for the surface tension. And what do you get for the surface tension? Uh, 58.9. 58.9 times 10 to the minus 3. So if you wanted to. You could put 0 0.589, correct? 0 0.589, right? Yeah. So there you go. Is that right? All right. Half of the game for boiling and condensation is get the right correlation and then find all the properties that go into it. Uh, in that same table, you get HFG, don't you? So HFG is 2257 two, kilojoules per kilogram. Now, I'm going to look right here for the CPL, CPL for the liquid. So the specific heat liquids in the same table, can you see it? What is it? 4.217. At this point, I write the units kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. And sometimes I had a, an exam problem. Remember that, our last exam? And in one table, you're going to grab a specific heat that's joules per kilogram Kelvin. And out of another table, a different property, but you needed it in, and, it would, and the table was kilojoules. Be careful. Right here, though, we see kilojoules, kilojoules, they're going to work. You could almost forget the units, but be careful because maybe in the next problem, we'll be off by a thousand. Okay?
you know, because of that kilo. One may only have it. They, they, this one could have come in and said 4217 without the kilojoule. Now, if you just put the 4217 in there and then you put the 2257, you're going to be off. You got to watch out for that, please. Okay, so put a point and then the kilojoule. Very good. The Prandtl number is actually in the same table. Um, density of the liquids in the table, but it's not the density of liquid, it's the reciprocal. It's a specific volume of saturated liquid. So you just reciprocate it to get the density. Likewise, the density of the vapor is 1 over the specific volume of the vapor. So V sub G is a common notation in thermodynamics. So rho of the liquid, I don't like this subscript L, but they're using it. It's too easy to confuse with one and it gets looks messy, but one over the specific volume of saturated liquid. Okay. Um, I think we covered all of them, the hard ones. And you just put it into the equation and when you calculate, you'll get 11.36 kilowatts. Um, you're going to get this HFG again that has that kilojoules. So naturally, it's not going to be watts. It'll be more like kilowatts. All right. Okay, how about for part B? Sorry, I don't complete that. I'm showing you where to get the numbers, put it in, and make sure your units work. How about for part B? Oh, maybe I should spend some time. What about the viscosity of the liquid? I should have gotten that one. This viscosity of that liquid that's in the same table A6. And the viscosity of liquid, you come down 279 times 10 to the minus 6 Newton second per meter squared. Right? Yeah, 279 times 10 to the minus 6 Newton second per meter squared. All right. <clears throat> Now, what about the evaporation rate? Uh, oh, I forgot one thing. If this is Q double prime, if you want Q, what do you have to multiply that by? The area. And they give you the diameter. So the area is pi d squared over 4. Okay. Now, what about the evaporation rate? Well, m dot evap is equal to the Q heat transfer rate times HFG. Where did that equation come from? First of all, does it look reasonable? What? Well, Somebody says, what is it from? Well, tell me what it's from what? Yeah, energy balance. Yeah. Um, you go back to thermo 1, and uh, you could put in a little control volume where you have the mass flow rate going in, the same mass flow rate going out. That would be my evaporation rate if it's coming in liquid and going out vapor at the same pressure and same temperature and I have to then supply the rate of heat transfer to it so this is Q rate of heat transfer to that control volume and so the Q would be like the mass flow rate uh, and it's going to come out HG minus HF coming in that's just HFG so the evaporation rate is Q divided by HFG all right. Well, you bring it over or multiply by. Hold it. Um, oh, I need to divide it by, right? Sorry. Divide. You're right. Yeah, chase. make sure uh, HFG. Look at the units. Yeah. All right. Um, notice that this one is in hours. How many seconds in an hour? 3,600. No problem. Okay, what is the ratio of the surface heat flux to the critical heat flux? So you have to go calculate the Q double prime max. That was a different correlation. That was our other equation. Uh, you can't take 
uh, this correlation, the, the Rosenau correlation, can sort of extend it all the way to the point. No, no, just use the different correlation for the maximum. And where is that maximum correlation? I can't find it. The critical heat flux for nucleate pool boiling, that's equation 10.6. So 10.5, now we use 10.6. Um, that's worth that constant C without a subscript. And you have to say, am I doing it for a flat surface or the surface of, 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 a, of a cylinder? And then you have HFG. You have the row of the vapor. And then you have a bunch of parentheses to the one fourth power. Um, I'm going to say you can you can make that calculation. I have them over here. That constant C um, is the point point one four nine. And you calculate the Q max to be 1,255 watts, kilowatts per meter squared. Compare it to our Q, um, which uh, I don't know if I have a separate Q. I think I multiplied already by area right in here. I should have maybe put a separate line for Q double prime. And then the ratio is 51%. All right. The last part of the equation, it says, what excess temperature is required to achieve the critical heat flux? This one, you really don't use an equation for it. What you do is you go back to the plot, and, and this is Nukiyama's pool boiling curve for water at 1 atm, and we're doing water at 1 atm, and you say, at this maximum, what is our excess temperature? And you just read it from the figure. It's 30 degrees C. Okay. All right. Any comments on that problem? <sighs> film boiling. What's the difference between nucleate and film again? You have a film of vapor at the surface. And so you're going to have a lot higher surface temperature. Well, you would look for this H for the convection, but when you have the convection heat transfer, you also have radiative transfer. And these are the correlations that are in our textbook. Let me try and explain them. So you'll have a, a, a relationship that looks like our maximum, okay, for the, uh, to, to be able to unravel to find the convective, average convective coefficient. In this equation, they have this HFG, and it looks almost like a typo. They have a little, you know, prime up there. What's that mean? Derivative? No, no. Per unit length? No, no, no. It's just a notation to say it's a adjusted or corrected latent heat. So it's primarily the latent heat plus 0.8 times specific heat constant pressure of the vapor times the excess temperature. I didn't make up these correlations. A lot of people spent a lot of time, and they just said, this is the best fit we have for the data, and they published the paper. All right, so notice that you just need to be careful, again, with that kilojoule per kilogram, making sure that this is in kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, and, and the units work out. All right. Then there's some discussion in the textbook. I'm not repeating it all. But to get an average H, which is a combination of the convective and a radiative component, you would calculate a radiative component multiplied by 3 quarters. Don't ask me why. It's experimentally justified. Add it to the convective from this correlation, and then you have an H. So you could then go for that film and say, well, what's Q double prime? It would be the H times the TS minus T surface, or SAT, T SAT. All right, I look at this equation right down here for the radiative. I see, oh, there's my emissivity, epsilon. Hey, what is that sigma? 
surface tension? No, 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 no. Step and Boltzmann constant for that sigma. And then you have Ts to the fourth, T sat to the fourth, divide by the temp temp dif temperature difference. This is a, a, a effective H for radiative transfer. All right, you ready to use these equations? Oh, I forgot to emphasize, you need to read the textbook, but here is this equation that we just talked about. The constant C is 0.62 for horizontal cylinders, 0.67 for spheres. The corrected latent heat with that prime on it accounts for the sensible energy required to maintain temperatures within the vapor blanket above the saturation temperature, and they give it to you right here. It is known to depend weakly on the Prandtl number of the vapor, so just do it ignoring the Prandtl number of the vapor. Okay, this sentence right here though. Vapor properties are evaluated at the system pressure and film temperature, so not at the saturation temperature of the fluid, but at the film temperature, which is Ts plus Tsat divided by 2. So if I wanted to calculate, let's say, um, rho of the vapor. I have to look for the density of the water or whatever fluid that I have at a given pressure and at a given temperature. The temperature is the film temperature. What is the pressure that I need to evaluate that vapor density at? At the system pressure. Okay, what do they mean by the system pressure? So I have a, a thinking Nukiyama's experiment, maybe I have some surface in here that's film boiling going on. It's in some pool of fluid. So I have film boiling that's in a pool of fluid. And uh, unless I, I have it in a pressurized container, that system pressure is going to be 1 atm. So I'm going to give you this challenge. I want you to find, right now, calculate the vapor uh, density in units of kilogram per meter cubed, numerically three significant digits, four... 1 atm for the pressure, right? And the temperature, we're going to work a problem, and that temperature that we need to evaluate it is going to be 550 Kelvin. All right, this is a little bit of a challenge. I'm going to give you a few minutes. I'm going to turn it on, mul not multiple choice. Numeric input right here. Put numeric input. And... Work hard. Give me the vapor density for water vapor at that pressure, 1 atm, and at that temperature of 550 Kelvin. All right, so let's pick it up here. We're interested in calculating density of vapor, and we want it, numeric value, in units of kilograms uh, per meter cubed, correct? All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop, and we'll show all of our results. And as we show the results, we're seeing a lot of people, 57% of the class. And how did you get that value? It's on a table. It's in the table. And what table number is that? A3? A4, table A4. Thank you. We'll call this correct. We'll call this correct. Um, this one I'm going to call close enough. And the rest, I just have to say you're, you're out there a little bit, okay? So if you went and got, uh, let me stop that. If you went and got V sub uh, G out of the steam table, you would be getting it at um, the pressure equal to P sat corresponding to 550 Kelvin. 
And that saturation pressure at 550 Kelvin is a lot higher than one ATM, isn't it? How many bar is it? I forget. I'm going to look it up real fast. 61 bar. That's like 61 ATMs. Close enough. So you're going to get a lot higher density than if it's at one ATM. Okay, so uh, you could use the table A4, correct? Or you could do it another way. How many people said, I believe it's going to behave as an ideal gas, and so the rho of the vapor would be the pressure, then uh, uh, divided by R bar molar mass of the vapor absolute temperature. Anybody do it that way? You can do it that way. Let's see what you get if you just use the ideal gas equation because at 1 ATM and 550 Kelvin is pretty warm. I mean, it's low pressure, high temperature. It behaves as an ideal gas. So we would put in here 101.3 for that kilopascal of the atmospheric pressure, 18.02 for the molar mass of water vapor, 8.314 for the universal gas constant and 550. What does this give us? Let's uh, take a numeric input and we'll do a new numeric study here. So calculate this and see what you get. Yeah. All right, let's go ahead and stop this. And we'll take a look at the results. Hey, look at that. That's pretty impressive. So that's essentially the same number. Okay, so I'm just trying to point out a challenge to calculate um, properties that are needed in the correlation. Okay, um, there's another one. The thermal conductivity of the vapor at what temperature and pressure? Pressure really doesn't affect K, but the temperature of 550, the film temperature. Okay, what is this guy right here? It's really hard to see. What is that? Kinematic viscosity. All right, so I need the kinematic viscosity. So what is the kinematic viscosity of vapor? Water, so it's water again. At what pressure? 1 ATM and 550, 550 Kelvin. So another chance to pick up here. So this is um, uh, V, uh, H2O, one atmosphere, 550 Kelvin. And we want this numeric input in units of meter squared per second. Meter squared per second. I'm going to make it a little easier. 10 to the minus 6 meters squared per second. So you, you have to put in a number, then I know that it's times 10 to the minus 6 meters squared per second. So let's get that one done. All right, let's stop it and let's show the results. And yeah, 100% correct. What table? A4. The header of table A4 says atmospheric pressure. Perfect. Everything's good. As I talked about the equation quite a bit, now I need to solve a problem. So what do we have? We have a steel bar, 20 millimeters in diameter, 200 millimeters long. Right away you can get the area, the surface area of that steel bar. It has an emissive. It's removed from a furnace at 455 degrees C. Hot? Yeah, that's hot. Suddenly submerged in a water bath under atmospheric pressure. So the water is at atmospheric pressure, and the highest temperature the water could be is saturation temperature, 100 degrees C. It doesn't say that the water bath is saturated, but we're going to assume that it's 100 degrees C. Estimate the initial heat transfer rate from the bar. Well, do you think you have free convection? No, too high of an excess temperature. How about nuclear boiling? No, look at the excess temperature. It's going to be too high. You basically, you're going to have the film boiling. 
So let's just assume it's going to be the film boiling and you apply the correlations that we've been working on. So if you wanted to estimate the initial rate of heat transfer, you can get an H, which is some H based on the boiling convection correlation. And then we'll use the relationship that you add three-fourths of the H from a radiative analysis. All right, the H from the radiative is maybe the easiest. That H from the radiative, you had the emissivity of the surface, the Stefan Boltzmann constant. You had the temperature of the surface to the four minus temperature of the saturated fluid that it's dunked in. I know I'm assuming that's 100 degrees C divided by. Ts minus T sat. That's the equation we just had. Everything is known in that. You can calculate the H rad. The H rad comes in at around 37.6 watts per meter squared Kelvin. Maybe I should have asked you to do that calculation, but in the interest of time, it's done. All right, how about the convection? H convection. Well, if you got a Nusselt number, you would multiply by the K and then divide by the diameter because that's our length scale for a, a diameter for a rod or a steel bar. Okay. That Nusselt number is coming from the correlation that we just had up. Maybe if I skip back. It's from this equation right here. See, there's the H convection. There's the D, and we need the thermal conductivity of the vapor. So you can see that I need to use this equation. So instead of rewriting it, I need to solve for it. What value of C am I going to use for a horizontal cylinder? 0.62. Again, this line right here, vapor properties are evaluated at the system pressure and film temperature. And we already calculated some of them already. All right. Um, when you take a look at converting this to Kelvin, you have the two temperatures, T sat is 373 Kelvin. The T surface converted to Kelvin is 728 Kelvin. The temperature film comes in at 550 Kelvin. All right. So uh, you calculate this new salt. This is of the vapor. And when I make the calculation, the new salt is uh, 84.03. The thermal conductivity of the vapor is 0 0.0379. The diameter 0 0.020. And we get a convection coefficient that's about 159. What are the units? Watts per meter squared Kelvin. We then can get this effective H. That effective H rolls in at 187 watts per meter squared Kelvin. And then if you want to get the initial rate of heat transfer, remember, as soon as the bar starts to cool down, well, you would have to update your estimates of everything. Um, but this is initial when it's still that same temperature. We would have Q is equal to the area, uh, or H, times the area, pi DL, times delta T, uh, which is temperature surface minus temperature saturation. And you come in at 835 watts. Let me show you some numbers on the next page. So... There's the emissivity, the diameter, the length. That's the area using pi dl. The temperature in C of the surface in C and K, water in C and K. Film temperature, 550. The saturation pressure at the film temperature is enormous. So be careful. Don't just use the steam table. Um, use the ideal gas treating water vapor as ideal gas, that type of table. 
all right, the, this is our excess temperature, um, 0.62, density of the liquid, density of the vapor. Notice I emphasize that, that it's at the film temperature, 1 atm, about 0.4. HFG, there. Um, thermal conductivity, watts per meter Kelvin. This is um, HFG g prime which is our corrected latent heat you can see how much it changes all right ready to press on forced convection well you thought pool boiling was hard well now you have forced convection boiling and it's very common so you have fluid coming in a pipe the pipe is hot uh, you're coming in where it's all liquid and then you start to get some bubbles on the walls. The bubbles flow into the core. They're going to be buoyancy driven. The effects of gravity are going to be there as well as the orientation of the pipe. You'll get a vapor um, form larger pockets in the core. And you can get a vapor core with the liquid on the side push to the side because that's the fastest region in the core and then you finally get um, only liquid droplets and then you get all vapor so what would uh, what are they showing on this side of the plot they're showing as a function of distance lining up things like that what are they showing on this scale what are they showing takes a while to get oriented with these plots. They're showing the magnitude of the convection coefficient. So let's just compare this one with this one. What, what's happening down in this region? It's liquid. What's happening in this region? It's vapor. So would you expect them to have the same H or the H for the vapor lower? than the H of the liquid. Yeah, that makes sense. The H of the vapor, uh, the vapor is lower than the H of the liquid. Now, what about in this region? What are they showing? It's a lot higher. <laughs> it, it's like th that impact of the nucleation sites of the vapor being swept away and then the liquid being forced back to it new liquid and then it vaporizes so you pick up a larger H the convection coefficients higher if you go back to chapter one you can see that they give you some values of H's for boiling and they're high likewise the convection coefficient for condensation professor where's the equation so that we can make some calculations look at the pool boiling was hard enough now let's talk a little bit about condensation. Well, there's two types. One is dropwise and one is film. Maybe you have some experience. Have you ever seen condensation in your life somewhere? Have you seen little drops form on a cooler surface, but then it wets it completely and maybe even drains? That would be film. Yeah. Where'd you say? What did you say? Where at? very humid in a shower you take long showers and maybe the walls or the ceiling of the shower was cold or maybe i've been in apartments and i swear there's no insulation on top of that shower and i'll be showering away and all of a sudden drip anybody had that experience cold drop hit you on the head where'd that cold drop come from i look up and that's all the condensation on the ceiling of the shower anyway there's lots of examples your uh, cold beverage in the summer sitting on a table you get condensation on the outside, drop-wise, and then it can start to flow. Uh, this gives you a higher H. Uh, H is greater for drop-wise. The film is a lower H. This is one of those trade-offs. This one, you can do a decent job of trying to analyze it mathematically. Uh, drop-wise, much more empirical. But what you'll find that sometimes they'll use a simple underestimate of the H in an analysis or a prediction of behavior so that they have factors of safety in the design. Um, you don't want to work for General Motors and design something to reject heat and 
and have it like keep your engine cool or something and yet on the hottest day of the year oh i'm sorry we didn't we designed it to only work up to about 100 degrees f day and so in san antonio whenever you have 105 please don't drive your automobiles you think that's going to fly that's not going to fly so as engineers it's very intuitive you want factors of safety you want to come in low in your estimate <laughs> And then if it's higher, great, it's a better heat transfer and the system is going to be cooler than it needs to be. Okay, laminar film condensation. So you put a knife edge plate that's cold in a vapor and what are you going to start to get? You're going to get some condensation. In the presence of gravity, what does the liquid condensation want to do? Drain, drain. So it's hard enough, but let's just do this. Let's come down here at a, at a particular location and cut across right there. And let's think about the velocity. The velocity inside this, con this liquid layer that's draining. And which way is the flow going, up or down? That's the first question. The flow is going down. All right. Right here is a solid surface. What's the velocity at the solid surface? No slip, zero. So good, we got a point. And so where's going to be the maximum velocity? Is it going to be something like it goes maximum and then back out to zero? Is that what it's going to be for our velocity profile? Well, think about out here. What's out here? Vapor. What's in here? Liquid. Okay. At this interface, do I need to make it go to zero? I know that way out here that's but what what what's a key thing? Can I have the liquid does this make sense or does it make sense that maybe the the liquid velocity does something like this? And then if I said I want to plot the vapor velocity, there's a, a, a rapid uh, transition like that. I know that I'm really not interested in the vapor velocity. I'm interested in liquid velocity. Well, what do you think? Is it closer to A or closer to B? Where the maximum is real close to the wall or the maximum is real close to that side way out at the edge? Which one is it? Let's take a A or B clicker. Everybody wants points. All right, everybody's in. We stop. We then take a look at the results, and B have it, has it. And so it looks like that. Again, you may want to think, well, what's happening in this, this vapor region right in here? Well, uh, if you take a look at the uh, shear stress in the liquid, shear stress in the vapor, you have the viscosity of the liquid is much, much greater than the viscosity of the vapor, and yet the... The, the, the rate of change, if I do a um, uh, law of viscosity there, the rate of change of the U, this is U going down with respect to Y going out in the liquid matches mu of the vapor, the rate of change of U with respect to Y in the vapor. And what happens is, is, is this is so small that this can be very large and I have a very rapid change of the velocity in the vapor but don't worry about that well, it's, this is the profile in the liquid okay now if we want we try and reproduce it not to clutter it up and we say what about our temperature what about our temperature profile what does that look like and here what we'll do is i know that velocity we're pointing down but we'll use temperature going back up now high versus low so in this, where you're condensing, just do the, t tell me, is it, is it TS and then T far away in the fluid, like T sat? Is it like that? Or is TS above and T sat below? Which, you have to get the right, what's hot? The, the vapor or the surface? Well, it's condensation. The surface is cold. So... <clears throat> It's, it's like uh, putting, 
here is T sat, and here is T S. All right. So what does our temperature profile do? Well, at the surface it's like T S, and then what is, what is it out here? It's getting closer and closer to the saturation temperature. And then like that would be the profile going out. So the temperature would be coldest. There you go. Well, what you can do is you can do a momentum analysis. You can do an energy analysis. You can develop some equations for the rate of growth, the thickness delta of our laminar film condensation and the book has quite a bit of that there's no exam problems on it there's no homework problems that I think that I signed on it and um, it takes a little bit of analysis but it's simply momentum energy and continuity okay there you go so right here is a better plot of the velocity in this liquid layer the maximum just about right there just a little bit inside and then I'm sorry I'm curious about the pressure the pressure yeah you would do a um, this is the X which way do they have X X direction and you have to do the momentum in the X but when you do the momentum in the Y you're going to conclude that the pressure out here at this layer penetrates into the film so um, you have the hydrostatic pressure out here. In the presence of gravity, that's what gets the drainage, the liquid to, to fall. Okay. Um, there, there's a lot of the analysis in the chapter on they make this approximation for the temperature profile, they make this approximation for the velocity profile, approximating the derivative out there at zero, be, be, make it flat, uh, do a energy, little control volume energy and momentum analysis, and you can come up with a correlation like this. That's what you're looking for. We're in the hunt for H, and after a not, lot of analysis, you can get uh, develop a correlation. Curve fit with the experimental data for one of the properties. After a while, guess what it can transition to? Turbulent. Turbulent lamin. Well, it goes from laminar to turbulent film condensation. Uh, what would be the critical um, Reynolds number for this? And what's that length scale? Can you see they have the RE thickness? What's the length scale on the Reynolds number? The thickness of the film. And what is the critical for the transition around 1800? See? So now you have to remember 2300, half a million. For the Rayleigh number, you have to remember um, different numbers. Some of them have it like 10 to the ninth for the critical Rayleigh number. And here it's around 1800 for uh, film condensation. Typically, we have tubes, tubes that could drip onto other tubes. And you have a bank of tubes, which condensation, you have a whole bunch of drops or film. A lot of people have studied these. I just highlight it. This is the area we're skipping. You could have condensation in tubes, and the tube then fills up in direction of flow. Air conditioning systems, that's what we have. We have condensers and it's finned on the outside but tubes on the inside and that's what's happening so a lot of this is skip 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 um, I just talked about the condensation and the laminar film on a vertical surface but really those are skip as well all I'm doing is just introducing you to those concepts what are you going to be tested on the easiest boiling pool boiling Nucleate as well as film. All right? And I think that's the only homework problems. I did this first and the fourth or the last homework problem. One of them dealt with film boiling, the last problem, and one of them just nucleate boiling, the first problem. 
So with that, I thank you for your attention. I'm done for today. I'll see you next week.